the general plan is shown here. I will provide an introduction just to introduce some ideas about how volcanic eruptions affects climate variability. Then I'll select some examples from 2010 to the present day to highlight extreme weather events, ocean heat waves, polar sea ice changes, as well as the 2014 to 2016 ANSO. Then I'll come and draw up some conclusions. Next slide. Definitions of climate change is really a problem. If you look at the United Nations definition, they assume they know what is directly and indirectly causing <laughs> climate change due to human activity. However, most of the climate change they're talking about is not really global climate change, it's more regional. And I'll show you why later. The IPCC single out carbon dioxide as the culprit. And this is not scientifically proven. But because of the pause in temperature rise, all weather changes are now included under climate change, just to confuse the public. Next slide, please. What is the order of importance of the different factors? I think to me, very important, the first order is the astronomical forcing and the sun. And clearly what is global climate change are the glacial, interglacial cycles with major shifts from warm to cold. The other changes are largely regional, including monsoons, seasons, and even day to day. We all know that midday sun is the hottest, especially in desert regions. Second order in importance are the geothermal heat, what is called plate climatology, according to James Chemis in 2014. And his definition is shown here, how geological forces affect the hydrosphere and atmosphere, including terrestrial and submarine volcanic eruptions. Their associated circulation changes and gases release, including water vapor, sulfur dioxide, and carbon dioxide. And third order ranking is, are the human induced changes, including all the things that we may be doing, but they are much less important. It's quite questionable whether this will become number one instead. Next slide. How does a volcanic plume from a subaerial eruption or eruption on land when it penetrates the stratosphere? It will inject water vapor. Most volcanic plumes, because they are hot, they carry lots of moisture. And this will interfere with the jet stream, the normal circulation and they may recreate atmospheric rivers. Here you can see a picture of one over Canada, western part of Canada, what is known as Pineapple Express. And because of the interference, climate variability may take place. Next slide. My simple classification of volcanic eruptions are shown in this slide. Volcanic eruptions on land, terrestrial or subaerial, they switch on hot air followed by cooling, including a variety of things taking place. We have a scale for measuring this, and this is what is called VEI, the Volcanic Explosivity Index. Submarine volcanic eruptions on the seafloor are less well understood and not many people are studying it. And this is one of the problems. It switches on hot seawater, or what is called blobs, causing sea surface temperature to rise because it's lower in density. Pressure changes, circulation changes, moisture redistribution, 
continental warming, severe weather events, including cyclones. But of course, if you have an initially submarine eruption forming a new island, it will become subaerial. And this is what I call mixed eruption, the third category. Magmatic composition is also important. Acidic magma tends to be much more explosive. But of course, in terms of temperature, basaltic magmas are much higher than intermediate and acidic types. Next slide. This is my summary of the terrestrial model. And usually this leads to major cooling because of the ash and aerosols, reducing solar radiation, warm air store more moisture, so water vapor redistribution will take place, and hot air rising usually results in low pressure. Circulation changes may also take place. Eruption changes normal air circulation, it creates clouds, destroy ozone, release a variety of gases, and very important is water vapor. Cool air also store less moisture. Impact may be longer lasting if the VEI is higher. VEI is measured by the particulates released by the volcanic eruption. The larger the volume, the higher the VEI. Yellowstone eruption, is thought to be VI8. Pinatubo, the biggest eruption in the last 100 years, is VI6. So this gives you some idea. Next slide. Since the late 1970s, we are lucky enough to have satellites providing a variety of information, including sea surface temperature mapping, and very useful too are the profiles of aerosols from, from volcanic eruptions. We are now able to track day by day movement of volcanic clouds. And then, when, then we can look at the observation records on extreme weather to try to deduce what is really happening. Next slide. Initially, I got very much interested in explaining rainfall in Hong Kong. And in 1982, for the first time, I found a paper published in Scientific American by Rampino and Shelf, tracking the eruption cloud day to day to circle the globe in 21 days, reaching above Hong Kong in 11 days, and the timing in terms of heavy rainfall seems to match perfectly. These aerosols continue to circle the globe for much of the remainder of the year, resulting in the wettest, second wettest year on record with disastrous floods and landslides and extending our wet season from April to November. So it's quite drastic change in a way very difficult to explain without the volcanic eruptions. Next slide. The opposite of heavy rainfall are droughts. And in 1991, the biggest eruption in the past 100 years, Pinatubo, VI6, resulted in a global drought year due to the transfer of water vapor into the stratosphere. 55 kilometers above sea level. During the eruption on the 14th of June, you can see that in terms of the blue cloud, there's already an enormous white cloud formed by Typhoon Yanya, which is passing Luzon at the time. And basically the eruption cloud, as the eruption reach a maximum, it reached 55 kilometers. It's basically overwhelming the typhoon cloud, which is only reaching up to 12 kilometers. And it dissipated into a tropical depression rapidly. 
So that's the battle of the giants in a way. So the volcanic eruptions won by far. But the amount of water vapor reaching the stratosphere led to this global drought. In Hong Kong, five and a half months has already passed before the eruption, but it turned out still to be the 11th driest year on record. So the reason why it's a drought year was because of circulation change with predominantly offshore wind from the Asian continent into the South China Sea. So Hong Kong is being affected by this. Much drier year resulting from this circulation change as compared to El Chichong, where the moistures are coming from the Pacific. So onshore wind bringing in the moisture. Next slide. Some marine volcanic eruptions are summarized in this slide. Basically, the volcanic eruptions, if they are submarine, the longer lasting one will have much bigger impact than the shorten, shorter lasting one. El Hero in the Canary Islands in 2011 erupted for six months until March end of March 2012. And another long lasting submarine eruption is Nishinoshima, 940 kilometers south of Tokyo. This lasted more than two years. So one cause, North Atlantic warming in 2012, Nishinoshima caused North Pacific warming over at least a two year period. The other submarine eruptions that I have studied are much shorter lasting. So they, their impacts are much smaller as a result. I've listed here some of the important impacts of submarine volcanic eruptions at the bottom. Basaltic lavas are usually around 1,200 degrees Celsius. So it's a potentially heat source causing the seawater to boil. You being a bad conductor of heat, the hot water will rise to the surface to create blobs. Next slide. The monitoring network of data boys is provided by Argo since the early 2000s. So these are operational floats measuring conductivity, temperature, and pressure down to a depth of 2,000 meters. So different countries are responsible for this network. So we now have a system of monitoring sea surface temperature provided by satellites for SST, as well as real measurements from this Argo network. So ideal for picking up submarine volcanic eruptions. Next slide. Now, this is a table that I try to summarize some of the selected volcanic eruptions during the period 2010 to 2012 with their major climatic impact. I will just comment on a few of these. The Iceland eruption in 2010, the one that caused all the transatlantic flight to stop, is responsible for moisture penetration deep into the continental interiors. Central Europe, for example, Slovakia, well, had the wettest year on record since 1881. And because of the heavy rain, temperature was much lower as a result. So the rainfall caused the cooling. And we have severe flooding in Central Europe in a number of countries. El Hero, I think I should mention because it has resulted in the lowest sea ice in the Arctic on record following this North Atlantic warming. Nishinoshima in 2013 to 2015 similarly caused North Pacific to have to result in the low 
Arctic sea ice near the Bering Strait, which seems to be consistent with its location. Then multiple eruptions in 2019. So in Tonga, so several submarine eruptions in combination can result in a blob forming in the South Pacific Ocean. And this resulted in Antarctica sea ice to shrink and record temperatures to be recorded in 2020 in February. So these are just some of the highlights. Next slide. Here you can see some of the satellite images, as well as some of the actual photos from the air to show the seawater boiling during the El Hero eruption for six months from October to March. So all these things are available. You can see floating pumice, cooked fish, and so on. Next slide. So the North Atlantic warming is shown on this slide. So this was taken in June. So the end of June, 2012. And you can see that the North Atlantic is clearly much hotter than the North Pacific. So El Hero is responsible for this hot water patch. North Atlantic warming. Next slide, please. The weather events that I have identified in the North Atlantic Basin during the year is summarized in this sketch, in this table. I'll just mention a few of these. April to July, it was the wettest summer in a hundred years in England and Wales. There are record temperatures in some places, for example, Virginia in July, and extreme weather events such as floods and droughts in different parts of the basin. So you can see extreme weather events are related. Hurricane frequency are also affected. It's a very active year for hurricanes, including in October, Hurricane Sandy, which caused 147 fatalities in New York. And the winter is also affected as a result in some parts of the region. Next slide, please. So two notable severe weather events during the year are shown here, Hurricane Sandy, and then the week, the wettest week in 50 years in England and Wales. You can see Somerset was severely affected by flooding. Next slide. I'll move on now to say something about the long and strong ENSO in 2014 to 2016 to show that ENSO events are very tricky. And in this case, why is this so long and why is it so strong? Normally, ENSO occurs around Christmas time, and that's why the name El Nino, the Christ child. But in this case, it's far from December. It's in August that it reached a peak. So we have to look at the differences. Next slide. The Pacific is a major source of geothermal heat. As we all know, the Pacific Ring of Fire, there are more active volcanoes in this part of the world than others. And where you have an oceanic crust that is extremely thin, as in the Marianas Trench, which is not so far away from the Shinoshima, if the volcanoes are active on the sea floor, it will have much greater impact especially if it's longer lasting. Magma output of volcanism within the ocean basins is currently about 70%, so quite a large amount. Next slide. I've summarized in this table some of the Pacific volcanic eruptions during this four year period, from 2012 to 2016. 
some of these are not so long, long lasting. For example, the first eruption, Hefri, reported by Carey in 2018. Even though it's quite large in area and quite explosive, it's a deep oceanic silicic eruption. So the temperature is not so high compared to basaltic magma. 14 vents have been identified. The real long lasting volcanic eruption is Nishinoshima, which lasted more than two years. Initially, this was submarine until a new island appeared, then it became mixed, but there were still lava flows into the ocean. 2014 to 15, hunger became active. Initially, it was submarine, then it changed into mixed eruption. A shorter eruption is found in the North Pacific, Exil Seamount, and then near Galapagos, one of the islands there called Woof erupted, and we have hot lava flows entering the ocean for a two month period. Kilauea was also active. Again, there was lava flow into the Pacific Ocean, contributing heat to the right location area. Next slide. This is an image of Nishinoshima taken by the Japan Coast Guard in November 2013. So the submarine eruptions have turned to a mixed eruption. And there were lava flows entering the ocean. Next slide. And this led to triggering a hot patch of water, what is called the North Pacific Block, recognized around January 2014. So it's quite a large area covering the North Atlantic. Now we need to understand why this developed. Next slide. The events linking this block to the Nishinoshima eruptions are summarized in this table. The first hot sea water over the Nishinoshima area was identified to be March. So this is the earliest initial warming of the Northwest Pacific. The appearance of a new island was in November and the block was hydrographically surveyed to be 800 kilometers wide and 91 meters deep. The island rose in elevation in December to 25 meters above sea level. And the temperature in, in February 2014 was 2.5 degrees Celsius above normal. By June 2014, the blob the name was given by this oceanographer, Nicholas Bourne. The size has doubled to 1,600 1, kilometers by 1,600 kilometers. Again, the same depth, 91 meters deep. It evolved into three patches, which we will see later on was from the SST. The island continued to grow in size in December 2014. There was volcanic eruptions continued episodically with lava flows entering the Pacific. But the blob eventually perished and ended in early 2016. Next slide. So what we think has happened is summarized in this diagram because of the circulation system changes. Hot seawater in the North Pacific provided by Nishinoshima will cause changes to ocean circulation. How does it do it? I think the equatorial currents will slow down and the Kyushu, which is fed by the equatorial current will weaken. So enabling this hot seawater patch to build up, the warm water will build up in slack areas of the gyres. So the ocean circulation map shows this. So into three patches, 
uh, off the coast of Alaska, off the coast of Victoria, Seattle, and off the coast of California and Mexico. Still not in the same correct position for El Nino, which is off the coast of South America. Next slide. Now the heat wave caused by the North Pacific block is highlighted in an article in September 2016 in National Geographic. They claim that this is a preview of our future oceans because of global warming. But this is in, in fact, if you believe it, naturally caused by submarine volcanic eruptions. We have mass mortality, including algal blooms in coastal areas, an invasion of tropical species. You have squids present off the coast of Alaska and so on. Next slide. Now these sea surface temperature anomalies in the end of June 2015 is shown here. The Wolf Volcano is located in the Galapagos. This is the correct area where the hot sea waters should normally be during Ansels. You can see it building up. The hunger eruption also helped in terms of the distribution of the hot and cold water in generating this Enso event. Then the Exil Seamount makes the North Pacific block even warmer in that location. Next slide. The Wolf Volcano erupted from May to June 2015. It's VI4 and the hot lava flows entering the sea can be seen here. So it's the final smoking gun in terms of warming the seawater at the correct location. Next slide. So by end of August 2015, you can see the strong Enso being established in the proper location. The only problem is, is in August 2015, not in Christmas time or December 2015. Next slide. This is a comparison of the hot water with the 1997-1998 Enso, which is also quite strong. But you can see that the 2014 to 2016 Enso is much, much, much more severe in terms of the warm water's extent. Okay, next slide. So what happened to the areas away from the coast in North America? We have what is called the polar vortex, which was used to explain how the polar air was able to penetrate deeper south over the North American continent. You have two winters on the Northwest coast of North America without winters. But then the cold air was any page was able to penetrate much further south, bringing low temperatures. So similarly in Europe, you have this. Next slide. So the North Pacific blob caused warming in the North Pacific Ocean. Now here you can see two sets of maps. One is for December during 2014, 2015, 2016 at the top. And then September at the bottom, also for these three years. And basically September is the month with the lowest sea ice each year after the summer melting. And you can see that the North Pacific blob has caused the sea ice near the Bering Strait to retreat much further if you look at the 2016 map at the bottom in September, compared to the 2014, it has shrunk much further. But this is a much more gradual change between the years 2014 to 2016. While in 2012, because of El Hero in the North Atlantic, 
we have record low sea ice in 2012. Next slide. So here in this diagram, you can see September sea ice based on two types of measurement, the multi-sensor method and the sea ice index. Macy is the multi-sensor. And the sea ice index is another way of measuring sea ice. But they saw similar pattern. But if you look at the changes over this time period of more than 10 years, the drastic change in sea ice was in 2012 due to Hell Hero. And then the more gradual change from 2014 to 2016 was from Nishinoshima. So these two submarine eruptions basically explain because of the timing and then the scale of the eruption in causing these declines in sea ice. Next slide. The final example that I use is the recent Tonga eruption in 2021 to 2022. Initially, this was a submarine eruption. Then on middle January 15th of 2022, it changed into a subaerial eruption. So in terms of lifespan, the submarine eruption was rather short. It erupted in December, at the beginning of December. So the South Pacific blob formed by the hot sea water is not so last, long lasting. The lifespan was much shorter, especially after the subarea eruption, you have heavy rain in the region, cooling it down even further. So the volcanic plumes entering the atmosphere will cause atmospheric changes, including jet stream meandering, the creation of atmospheric rivers, while the submarine eruption releasing geothermal heat into the ocean will lead to ocean circulation changes. So because of the pressure changes, eventually we have the change to La Lina conditions with record rainfall over Eastern Australia and New Zealand. Next slide. Here you can see two fortnightly maps of the region from mid-December to the end of December, and then mid-January, the beginning of the subaerial eruption on the 15th of January, and then middle of February. You can see that the temperature anomaly is not so high, just over two to three degrees Celsius. So the blob was actually cooler than 2019 to 2020. So blobs had free form at least three times based on our earlier table. One in 2014 to 2015, one in 2019 to 2020, and this is the most recent one. And this is the shortest lifespan one. And the reason why is because of the subaerial eruption on the 15th of January 2022. The heavy rain also helps to cool down the block. Right. Next slide. So this is a satellite image of the 2022 15th of January eruption. And this is a very large eruption penetrating the mesosphere at an elevation of 58 kilometers. So this shifted the conditions in the region to cooling because of the heavy rainfall. Next slide. So the South Pacific blob that developed measured during this seven day period, the hot blob is only two degrees Celsius above normal. Maximum area of this warmer water is 170,000 square kilometers. This cooled after the subaerial eruption on 15th of January. Next slide. 
the factors contributing to record rainfall in Eastern Australia and New Zealand after this Tonga mixed eruption are summarized here. Formation of a relatively short lifespan South Pacific block compared to 2019 to 2020. So comparisons are always interesting. We need to explain the differences. The transfer of large amounts of water vapor from the ocean into the atmosphere during the subaerial eruption on 15th January 2022, the low pressure condition on the ocean surface, the formation of clouds and the provision of condensation nuclei, the reduction of solar radiation caused by gases and other vol volcanic materials entering the atmosphere, the strengthening of trade winds, the meandering of jet streams, the development of atmospheric rivers, additional cooling caused by torrential rainfall, and then the eventual switch to La Nina conditions. Okay, next slide. My main conclusions from this work are shown here. Based on the timing and observation records, volcanic eruptions are an important regional driver of natural clim climate variability. Carbon dioxide identified by IPCC for anthropogenic global warming cannot be the cause. Atmospheric water vapor, cloud formation and distribution are much more important in weather changes than carbon dioxide. Volcanic eruptions contributing to the long and strong 2014 to 2016 ENSO include Nishunoshima, the Hunger eruption, the Exil Seamount eruption, as well as the Wolf eruption. Polar sea ice changes can be explained by ocean heat waves. Other people have used volcanoes, which may be active underneath ice sheet, but that's also another possibility. But they're all both due to the release of geothermal heat from volcanic eruptions. Climate modeling can be improved by taking into account the influence of volcanic eruptions on atmospheric and oceanic circulation. At present, this is just not done. The missing heat attributed to carbon dioxide storage in the ocean is better explained, I believe, by the release of geothermal heat through submarine eruptions. Volcanic eruptions as a natural cause of climate variability, both cooling and warming, is underestimated. It's part of our dynamic Earth. I have one final slide. Terrestrial and submarine volcanic eruptions, they are a natural experiment to learn from. The present assisted by observation records is the key to the past and the future because we are lucky enough to have this best observation records since the late 1970s to now, roughly about 50 years. Thank you very much. <laughs>